Aloha, this is Pastor Perry, and I want to thank you for joining us online to study the Word of God together. We pray that you will be blessed as the Holy Spirit ministers to you through this message and through God's Word. This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Adam, thanks for doing our reading. Would you pray with me as we prepare our hearts for the message this morning? Lord, we are so grateful that the gospel works, that when we put our faith in you, we become new creations, that our sins are forgiven, that we experience you, that we are filled with with joy and peace and love and forgiveness in ways that we couldn't have known without the Holy Spirit coming upon us. And for that, we give you thanks. Lord, but Lord, we are mindful that we live in a, a world that's polarized, and as Christians, we are forgiven but not perfect, and there's a tendency for us to become more like the world. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us when we become polarized, and we ask that we would be more filled with your Holy Spirit more often, that we would evidence grace and forgiveness and kindness and patience and love toward others, regardless if we agree or disagree with the things they're saying, that they might see that we stand firm in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that because of that, we might draw people to Jesus Christ, even as we heard today about Ezri being drawn to Christ through the love of those around her. Lord, fill us with your spirit now and teach us from your word that we might be instructed in the way that you would have us live as believers in Jesus Christ. I humbly ask for the Holy Spirit to use me now as we look into your word and as I preach. And we ask these things in the powerful, the saving, the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Although I was born in Coronado, California, I actually started school in Newport, Rhode Island when my dad in the Navy was transferred there. And I went to first and second grade at an exclusive private, small private school in, in Newport, Rhode Island. Well, then my dad got orders again and went back to the West Coast, this time in Long Beach, California. And I entered a California public school. And after my first day in a California public school, I came home and, and mom asked me, she said, well, how was school? And I go, well, the classroom stuff was really easy, but the plane was really hard. Because I'd gone from Rhode Island where plane was recess and on a swing, and I come to California and they're playing fistball and kickball and baseball and all these things that I'd never played before. I'd never even heard of. I had no idea how to play. So each day during P.E., when they'd line us up and people would pick teams, guess who always got picked last? It was me. I was like last. I was excluded. Nobody wanted me on their team. And that made me feel just so proud of myself. <laughs> Not. You've been there, perhaps. You felt excluded, left out, not wanted. You weren't invited to the party or the activity or, or whatever it was. Well, today, as we continue in our study in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul addresses some people who had been totally left out, people who had been excluded, and they were excluded because of their race. And pretty much, he's going to be talking about everybody in this room, unless, of course, you have Jewish blood. You see... The big controversy in the church, in fact, the first big controversy in the early church was whether you could be part of the church if you weren't Jewish. That Christianity was a Jewish religion, and the Jews were kind of wondering if non-Jews could actually be saved, and if saved, could they really have the Holy Spirit, and if they had the Holy Spirit, could they really be in the church? And that was the big controversy that Paul writes to. And we're going to see as we come to chapter 1 that the Apostle Paul is going to changes pronouns. Don't panic. <laughs> he, ch <laughs> he changes them. 
Some of you got that. <laughs> he changes them from saying we to changing them to saying you. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, if you have your outlines, if you take them out, if you didn't get an outline, you probably should jump up, go over to the back, grab an outline, or is Pastor Pete still in here? Pastor Pete's going to walk around with outlines. And if you want one, raise your hand because you've got a number of blanks to fill in. And so if you want an outline, if you raise your hand, we've got a couple of people that will be passing them out. And if you're on, watching online, they're available on our website. So number one here, look in your outline. A little review. God the Father has planned your blessings. God the Father has planned your blessings. And we, we talk about that, that from eternity past, God predestined. A better translation of the Greek word is predetermined. In other words, he planned ahead before he created anything how things are going to work. And one of the things in his plan was to provide for you eternal blessings in Jesus Christ. So he planned all this, and he planned that if you stepped into Jesus Christ, if you asked Christ to be your Savior, stepped into Christ, that your destiny now is sealed in Christ. That was the plan. And then the second thing we saw, number two, is that Jesus paid for your blessings. He paid for them. For this to happen, for you to be forgiven, for you to be redeemed, for you to have eternal life, Jesus had to die for your sins and mine, shed his blood. He died for us. But he not only removes our sin, he also removes the damage and the pain that our sins have caused ourselves and have caused other people and that other people's sins have caused us. The pain and damage is removed. And not necessarily all in this life but in the next life, totally removed. That brings us to our third point, which is new to our series, and that's this. The Holy Spirit protects your blessings. The Holy Spirit protects your blessings. So the Father planned them, Jesus paid for them, and the Holy Spirit protects those blessings to make sure that you will never, ever lose them. God will never renege on what he's given you. He'll never take it back. He'll never say, oops, I made a mistake. I didn't mean you. And the Holy Spirit protects that. Now, before we talk about our text in Ephesians 1, 13, and 14, I need to do some background because there's a lot of confusion and misunderstanding in the church about the Holy Spirit. And if you come to our text and you're confused about the Holy Spirit, where the Apostle Paul is going to use a metaphor It can be confusing. So I want to give you a brief theological education on the Holy Spirit. This is taken from the systematic theology course that I teach. It's on our website. And if you want to look it up, you'll find in lecture number 10 under pneumatology, I I say more things about the Holy Spirit. But this is just a little bit. And here we go. Some common or some important truths about the Holy Spirit. And one of the truths is a common misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit among Christians is not realizing that the Holy Spirit is a person, is a person, not understanding that the Holy Spirit is a person. And we'll explain in a minute what I mean by that, because you go, what do you mean the Holy Spirit's a person? Does he have a body? No, he doesn't have a body. He's a spirit, of course. Doesn't have a physical body. Um, What the Holy Spirit is not, he is not an emotion He is not an influence, nor is he merely the power of God, not an emotion, an influence, or the power of God. Sometimes people will come to a church and they go, oh, I can tell the Holy Spirit's here because they they, they feel so emotional while they're there. Well, what that means is they feel real emotional while they're there. The Holy Spirit is not an emotion any more than when your loved one walks in the room and you go, Well, it's not your loved one. That's just an emotion. Now, some of you are going, well, I don't have that emotion. I have kind of another, well, you know, we can offer counseling for that. Okay? But emotions are emotions. And the Holy Spirit might give you an emotion. I I hope you felt emotional when Ezra gave her powerful testimony. And maybe the Holy Spirit was moving you and moving her. But the Holy Spirit doesn't equal emotions. He also doesn't equal influence, but he does influence us. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to influence us, to convict us of sin, to, to, to lead us into righteousness, but he himself is not an influence. He is a person. He's not an it. He is 
not just the power of God. Some people think, well, the Holy Spirit is God's power coming upon you. No. The Holy Spirit is God, the third member of the Trinity. He's a person. Now, he has power. He has all the power of God the Father and God the Son. And he is very powerful. But he doesn't equal power. He's a person. So he's not an emotion or an influence, nor merely the power of God. He is a person. He is a person, but not just a person. He is also God. He's a person, but he's also God. So what do we mean by person? Well, I'm looking at your notes. His personhood, the Holy Spirit possesses the attributes of a person, the attributes of a person. We're going to mention three of them here. The first one is mind. The Holy Spirit has a, a mind. We're not going to look at all these scriptures, but I would like us to look at Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Romans 8, 26. And it says, And in the same way, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should. If you ever say, I don't know how to pray as I should. Well, that's biblical. <laughs> it says right here, you don't know how to pray as you should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So when you pray, sometimes you just have to say, Holy Spirit, kind of take over. I don't even know how to pray for this situation. And the Holy Spirit is praying on your behalf. Verse 27. And he who searches the hearts, that's the Father, knows what the mind of the Spirit is. That's the Holy Spirit. Because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Notice it says in verse 27, he knows what the mind of the Spirit is. The Holy Spirit has a mind. He thinks. He makes decisions. We also see here, number two, that the Holy Spirit under personhood has a will. He has his own will. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 11, it tells us this about the distribution of spiritual gifts. And it says in chapter 12, 11, but one and the same Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, works all these things, distributing to each one, those are spiritual gifts, individually, just as he wills. So he has a mind, he has a will, he makes decisions. That's something a person does. And yes, he has emotion, mind, will, and emotion. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, a verse that we'll look at once again later in the message, in Ephesians 4.30, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve him. That's an emotion. You can grieve the Holy Spirit when you sin. So the Holy Spirit has mind. He has will. He has emotion. Those are characteristics of what we call a person. He doesn't have a physical body, but he has mind, will, and emotion. But he's not just a person. He's also God. So under his deity we see that the Holy Spirit possesses the attributes of God. Not only does he have the attributes of a person, he has the attributes of God. Let me list four attributes of God that only God has. And the Holy Spirit has these, so he has to be God. The first one is what we call omniscience. And omniscience means that the Holy Spirit knows everything. And we've talked about in a previous sermon, when God knows everything, that means he not only knows everything actual, he knows everything potential. He knows what would happen if you marry Bob instead of Bill, or if you marry Sue instead of Mary. He knows the potential. He knows the potential if you take that job instead of this job, if you move here or you move there. He knows the actual and potential. Holy Spirit knows this. The second thing about the Holy Spirit, his attribute of God, is his omnipresence omnipresence. And omnipresence means he's present everywhere. And that's why I can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and our friends in Uganda can be filled with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit, he is everywhere. And notice I didn't say it is everywhere. He's not an it. He's a he. He's a person, but he's also God. He's everywhere present. So not only is he omniscient, not only is he omnipresent, but he has omnipotence omnipotence, and that means all-powerful. He has all the power of God the Father and God the Son. He's omnipotent. And lastly, we see here that he has eternality, eternality. He has always existed, and he will always exist. 
Again, this is a characteristic only of God. So the Holy Spirit is God. He's a person, mind, will, and emotion. He's God. He has the attributes of God. But the Holy Spirit also performs the works of God. He performs works that only God can perform, the works of God. Let me just mention three of them. There are many more, but three of them. First one is he was the cause of the virgin birth. He was the cause of the virgin birth. You might remember that Mary said, well, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And she's told, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be pregnant. So he's the cause of the virgin birth. Secondly, he was the agent in giving the scriptures, the agent in giving the scriptures. We're told in 2 Peter that holy men were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote the scriptures. The scriptures were inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. So you have the virgin birth, you have the giving of the scriptures. And thirdly, another act that the Holy Spirit does and did is he was involved in creation. He was involved in creation. If you read the creation story, you see the Spirit of God was hovering over the earth. And all three members of the Holy Trinity were involved in creation, though Jesus gets kind of special recognition as the one who created everything. And lastly, in that square box in the outlines, we see that the Holy Spirit is referred to as God. He's referred to as God in the scriptures. So not only does he have the attributes of God, not only does he do the works of God, but he's actually referred to as God. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. We'll just look at that one passage. Matthew 28, 19. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. And notice he says, in the name singular in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, usually when you have three people, you'd say in the names of, but he's showing name singular, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three are God, the Holy Trinity, and name carries with it the idea of character. So the Holy Spirit is referred to as God. In the book of Acts, a passage we didn't look at, in Acts 5, we have Ananias and Sapphira who lie and They lie, it says, to God, and it says they also lied to the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is God. And I said, like I said, if you want to know more about this or go deeper, look up our theology lecture series on our website, and you can go deeper in lecture number 10. Well, with that background now, I want us to come to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, our text for the day. Because the Apostle Paul is going to use a metaphor, and I don't want you to be confused when he uses a metaphor. You need to understand the Holy Spirit is not a thing. He's not an it. He's a person, and he's God. Ephesians 1.13. In him, in Christ, you also. See, this is where he changes the pronoun. He's been saying, we, 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 and he goes, you. Okay. In him, you also, you Gentiles, you people of a different race that we used to hate. You also, after listening to the message of the truth, what's the message of the truth? Here it is, the gospel of your salvation. That's the truth. Having also believed, you heard it, but then you acted on it. You believed it. Having also believed, what happened? You were sealed in him, sealed in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. With the Holy Spirit of promise. So, 35 times or more, the Apostle Paul uses the phrase, in Christ, in him, in the beloved, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, to show that when we step into Christ, that's how we get all these blessings. But we have to step into him. You might remember when we first started, I talked about the analogy of me being assigned on a Navy ship, the USS Gridley, and I stepped in the ship. And when I stepped in the ship, That ship's destiny, which had already been planned, is now my destiny. I stepped into the destiny of that ship. I went where the ship went. When you step into Christ, you now are part of his destiny. And what happens with Christ in the future happens with you because you step into him. And the Apostle Paul makes that abundantly clear over 35 times. And Because Jesus Christ was chosen by God, when you step into Christ, you are chosen. It's interesting, all the way back in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, 1, 
God the Father is speaking about Jesus the Son. In Isaiah 42, 1, this is what it says. God speaking, he says, Behold my servant, referring to Jesus, whom I uphold, and he says, my chosen one. Jesus is the chosen one. When you step into Christ then, you also are chosen. My chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And so when we come to Ephesians, we saw in Ephesians 1, verse 4, that God says he chose us, how? Not to be in him, he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Because Jesus is the chosen one, you step into Christ, you share the fact that you two are chosen. But unfortunately, many Christians, after they step into Christ, after they become a Christian, they become afraid that maybe they could step out of Christ, or they could fall out of Christ, or they could pull out of Christ, or they could deny Christ. And many Christians worry that maybe they've lost their salvation because of something they've done. And there are some churches that actually cater to that. Some churches have people living in fear that if you don't perform this ceremony or you don't do this or you don't go there or you don't come here, that you're going to lose your salvation. And so they have Christians living in fear rather than in hope and peace of what God has promised them for all eternity. And that's why we come to this point number three, that the Holy Spirit protects your blessings. You can't lose them. Notice what it says in Ephesians 1, 13. It says in the last part of that verse, you were sealed in Christ, in him, how? With the Holy Spirit a promise. And this is why I want you to understand the Holy Spirit is not a thing. He's a person. He's God. In Paul's day, people understood seals. They had lead seals, they had wax seals, they had clay seals, and if you had an important package or a document of some sort, you'd wrap it in string and you put this clay or this wax or this lead and you'd have a signet ring and I assume you would take it off before you stuck your finger into this hot lead and you take it off and on that signet ring was a carved figure that would be impressed in the, in the wax or whatever it was. And some of these signet rings, instead of having a carved figure, they had a precious stone that was carved, and that was called a cameo. And the people that had these cameo rings or signet rings were like the Roman emperor and other really important officials. And this was their seal, and only someone who was authorized could break this seal. And that's why you remember when Jesus, when they put the rolled the stone against his tomb, they sealed it. They, maybe they, they put ropes around it and big wax seals and emperor's seal in it, and you would break that seal at the pain of, of death in that case. So a seal represented protection. It represented authority. It represented security. And so Paul's readers understood this, that this is God's seal on your salvation. But the seal is not a thing. It's not an it. It's not wax. It's not lead. It's not clay. It is the omnipotent God, the Holy Spirit, who has you covered. Amen. And Jesus himself uses a different metaphor in John chapter 10, verse 29, to teach the same thing. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. He's saying once you're in God's hand, you can't be snatched out. And people go, yeah, well, can I jump out? And it's like, gosh, it's a metaphor. I mean, you could say, what if he sneezes? Hat shoo! Oh, no, I lost Perry. You know, it's, it's a metaphor. <laughs> the whole idea here is you can't lose your salvation. Because your salvation never depended on anything you did. And it doesn't depend on anything you do. It depends on what Jesus did for you. You just cried out, help! And he gave you help. And he rescued you and he saved you. But the Holy Spirit is not just a seal. As we continue to read in Ephesians 1, 14, the last part of that verse, it says, the Holy Spirit is also given as a pledge 
of our inheritance, a pledge. Some translations translate the word pledge as first installment. Other translations say down payment. Other translations say the Holy Spirit is a guarantee. That Greek word that's used there is a word that in modern Greek sometimes is used to refer to an engagement ring. And I kind of like the picture, though this isn't exactly what Paul's saying, but the idea that Jesus is the groom, the church is the bride, and the Holy Spirit is that engagement ring. It's a promise. And he's saying, I've given you the Holy Spirit as a promise that all the stuff I told you to have in the future, you're going to get it. So he's the pledge. He's the guarantee. He's the seal. He's all these things. But he's not a it. He's not a thing. He's God the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? And it's God the Holy Spirit with all this power is protecting your salvation. But then some people say, yeah, but... What about people who walk away from the faith? There's a very popular movement right now that's going on. It's called deconstruction. I don't know if you've heard of it. And deconstruction is where people walk away from their faith. And you might be wondering, well, do they lose their salvation then if they've deconstructed? And there are famous people who have deconstructed, and they call themselves ex-evangelicals. And you can find their posts and TikTok and Instagram thingamajigs, you know, all over the, I don't do that stuff, so I don't really know the technical term, and I don't suggest you go see that, but millions of people are, are listening to these people who have walked away from the faith. You have famous people like Joshua Harris, who, who wrote that book some number of years ago, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, and the book was about moral purity as a Christian, and now he denies this whole moral purity thing, and he's pulled the book from the publishers, and He's walked away from his wife, and he's divorced his Christian wife, and he's denied being a Christian now. He's walked away. He's deconstructed. And then there's the former Moody Bible Institute professor, Paul Maxwell. And Paul Maxwell was a co-writer with uh, Pastor John Piper on his Internet thing called Desiring God, and he wrote articles for that. And now Paul Maxwell says he's no longer a Christian. He's deconstructed. And then there's the former Hillsong worship leader and songwriter, by the name of Marty Sampson, who says, well, I wrote good love songs, but I never really was loving God. They were just love songs. And he says, I admire you Christians. He writes this on Instagram. I admire you. I adore you Christians. I love you so much. It was amazing being one of you, but I'm not anymore. He's deconstructed. And not just famous people are doing this. People are doing this in your homes, your children, your grandchildren. There's an excellent book. I'll put a slide up there as I mention it, this book called Deconstructing Christianity. It's co-authored by Elisa Childers and Tim Barnett. It, it's definitely worth a read, really for every Christian, if you want to understand what's going on. But it also gives some helpful advice on if you have family members that are deconstructing or friends, there's hope and how you should treat them. And, and basically, it's you love them and you don't waver from the truth. You teach the truth and you love them. But Elisa, in her book, writes this. She says, um, I was standing in the foyer of a church where I had just spoken at a Christian worldview conference when I was approached by an elderly couple with downcast faces. Without wasting time on pleasantries, the man said, our son, and then he got all choked up with tears and he stopped short. The gray-haired woman next to him laid her hand on his shoulder and continued, our son deconstructed. He isn't a Christian anymore. We don't know what to do. The man went on, my wife and I did everything. We brought him up as a Christian. We raised him in church. We taught him to love God and his word. We thought we'd done everything right, but several years ago, he started claiming that the church is too exclusive. Then he complained that Christians are intolerant and unloving. Now he tells us we're toxic and won't let us see our own grandchildren. His wife added, what do we do? How can we get our son back and be invited into our grandchildren's lives again? Childers writes, sadly, this story represents countless similar scenarios in which parents, grandparents, pastors, spouses, and friends are faced with the tricky task of figuring out how to navigate the complex and sometimes volatile phenomenon that is sweeping up their loved ones. Christian theologian who is not deconstructed <laughs> A professor of historical theology at Westminster Seminary writes this. He says, apostasy is nothing new. 
Every generation has had its profile apostates. What is new is the cool postmodern terminology that has emerged in the English-speaking West for doing so, that of deconstructing the faith. The authors write, in case you wonder what deconstruction is, they write, deconstruction is not about getting your theology right. We should all get our theology right. That's not what it is. It's not about trying to make your views match reality. It's about tearing down doctrines that are morally wrong to you to make them match your own internal conscience, moral compass, true authentic self, or whatever else is being called these days. Yet the goal for all Christians should be to align our beliefs with the word of God, despite our own personal feelings or beliefs on the topic. In other words, the deconstructors are rejecting the scriptures, they're rejecting truth, and they're find, trying to find that truth within themselves. So three, the question comes up, do these deconstructors lose their salvation when they walk away? Well, I think there's three possible answers. One is, yes, they lose their salvation. I don't hold that view. Apostle Paul didn't hold that view. I suggest you don't hold that view. The second thing is, maybe they looked like Christians, but they weren't really saved. There's a passage of scripture that speaks to that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. 1 John 2, 19, it says, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out in order that it might be shown that they all are not of us. Think of Judas. Judas fooled everyone. We have to assume that he preached sermons. We have to assume that he performed miracles or faked them or did something. No one had any idea that Judas was not a true believer, except Jesus, of course. But then he was exposed. So one possibility is all these people that are deconstructing never really had a saving faith. There's another possibility and that third possibility is, yes, they were believers. They've walked away from the Lord, but they haven't lost their salvation. What they have lost are the rewards that God wants to give them in heaven for the way they've lived their lives. Apostle Paul speaks to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. He talks about people who build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And you can build on the foundation of Christ with gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are good works done for God. Or you can work with, you know, do wood, hay, and stubble. And he says in verse 15, at the judgment, if any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. So what happens? They don't lose their salvation for becoming a Christian and then living an awful life for themselves but they lose any rewards that God would give them that they would enjoy and have for all eternity. And there's some indication in other parts of Scripture that there are levels of rulership in God's future kingdom. And he's saying, those of you who don't live the way you should down here, you're not going to be up here in the kingdom, uh, in this level. You're, you're going to be in heaven, but you're not rewarded like those who have served me faithfully. I don't hold to the first view that you can lose your salvation, as I said. But I think the other two are possibilities. These people were never saved and they faked it. Or they were saved. They walked away from the Lord. They're not going to lose their salvation. And hopefully they will repent and come back to him as they see your love and you standing for the truth. Because the Holy Spirit protects your blessings. I want to finish up with Ephesians 4.30. passage we looked at earlier. Now I'll read the whole thing. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, notice, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He's sealing you until you're completely redeemed and in heaven with Jesus Christ. Your future in Christ was planned by the Father. It was paid for by Jesus Christ. And it's protected by God, the Holy Spirit. Your job, though, is to make sure you have put your faith in Jesus Christ.
like to invite you to bow your heads, give you a moment to look at your heart. And whether you're watching online or in this room, I want to challenge you, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, to do it in this very moment. And here's how you can do it. To offer a prayer to the Lord that is simple but powerful, something like this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sins. And I believe you rose from the grave that you've conquered death. And I believe that you want to offer me eternal life. And so, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I yield my will to your will. I ask you to save me today. And Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. So please help me do so. Lord Jesus, thank you for all you've done for us. And we pray as Christians, you'd help us to live in a way that we live out the truth in a loving manner so we can draw others to you. And we pray this in your name. Amen.